We are going to get started uh, on the next session. Uh, Dr. Goldberg um, will be getting his team together to talk about traumatic lateral ligament injuries. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, you can get started. Um, and thanks again, everybody, for participating. Great. Well, thank you so much. What a whirlwind, an amazing event, as always, Celine. Um, of course, I'd like to um, just acknowledge the amazing work that you put in to make this uh, phenomenal whirlwind 24-hour um, marathon a success. Thank, and thank thanks, you Andy. Much. And uh, I also want to thank, actually, Ardalan for being a sponsor for your session. But uh, thank you for your kind words. Now, I'd like to introduce, we're going to do a topic of um, traumatic lateral ligament injuries. Um, and I'll just introduce our uh, uh, expert panel. Um, we got some amazing speakers. Um, first of all, myself, I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon in London. Uh, up until 2018, I was a consultant at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in, in London, but uh, continue to run uh, a research program both there at UCL and also Imperial College in London. Um, my fellowship was with uh, Paul Cook in Oxford uh, and also did a traveling fellowship to 15 centers of excellence around the world. Um, and because I was born in Cardiff, Wales, it gives me the right to have two flags next to my name, Welsh and English. Um, I then move further north to John McKinley, who's a consultant orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Um, he's also a consultant at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, so he also looks after kids. Um, he's fellowship trained uh, in uh, uh, Melbourne in Australia. And aside from being a great guy, he's notorious for being able to do 20 press-ups after having drunk three or four bottles of wine. Um, Frances Malagelada uh, is a consultant foot and ankle surgeon at the Royal London Hospital in the UK, um, which is also Bart's. He qualified from the University of Barcelona and so was able to hold the Spanish flag next to his name, uh, representing Spain and the UK. Uh, he's also an honorary senior lecturer at Queen Mary University, and his fellowship was in, in the UK uh, near the Queen at Windsor. Um, and finally, but not least, um, I'd like to introduce Nick Harris, who's currently, I believe, in Egypt uh, and kindly joining us there. So um, globally, we, we've got uh, full connection there. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Leeds and a professor of sports medicine at Leeds Beckett University. He was previously at Le Leeds General Infirmary and a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Leeds. Um, his fellowship in, was in Dublin with Mike Stevens, who many of you will know, but that does not give him the right to have an Irish flag next to his name. Now, we're going to uh, discuss the topic of um, traumatic lateral ligament injuries, and I'd like to hand over first to John McKinley, who's going to talk about the anatomy to start with. Thanks, Andy. And it was a lot more than 20 press-ups, so... Uh, I think that should be working now. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk uh, just about the the anatomy really of the, the ankle ligaments. So as we all know, uh, the, okay, here we go. Yeah, as we all know, ankle sprains are very common. We're pretty used to dealing with ankle sprains. Um, but what we forget is that a lot of the standard ankle sprains go on to cause problems, not only uh, long-term pain, but recurrence residual symptoms and and it's the leading cause of ankle arthritis. So the anatomy, we're going to cover the lateral ligaments, medial ligaments, and then the syndesmotic ligaments, and then we'll go on to some uh, management later on. So this is kind of what we learned at medical school has dug out my old textbook and it didn't really explain things very well. Thankfully, now we have the uh, benefit of some beautiful dissections and pictures that are available in the literature, which really help us to understand what, what really goes on. Um, so lateral ligaments first. So you can see here on this uh, beautiful dissection, the ATFL, I think, hopefully you can see my mouse, but running there, uh, it's in generally in two bands, and that's quite important. We'll come back to that later, uh, but generally it's not a single band. It's generally to the superior and the inferior fascicle. That's a broad ligament. It runs just from the uh, lateral, or yeah, just, just outside the articular surface of the fibula uh, to just distal to the articular surface of the talus. Uh, it generally runs fairly horizontal. 
in uh, in the neutral position. You can see in this one, there's a little bit of dorsal flexion, the ligament then goes more uh, vertical and in plantar flexion, it goes the opposite. And so it's usually in the plantar flex position that it's more uh, at risk of being damaged. And you can see this ligament again has two bands, it's quite a small and superior band, but they're two separate bands. Uh, this is a separate uh, dissection. You can see that this one's a single fascicle, but it's measuring out that the, the center of the ATFL is roughly 10 centimeters or 10 millimeters from the tip of the fibula and about 18 millimeters up. The, here we can see there are two bands uh, and in between there's a perforating art, uh, artery. So the, the perforators from the perineal and the lateral uh, malleolar artery coalesce and there's a, a vessel goes in between the anterior and the, or the superior and inferior fascicle. The superior fascicle is intraarticular, the inferior is extraarticular. And Jordi Vega has done quite a lot of work on this in here. You can see there are some arthroscopic pictures. So in a standard uninjured uh, ATFL, you can see the band like a hammock. And this is this, the middle picture showing the superior fascicle. On the right hand side, you can see where the superior fascicle has been damaged. And because it's intra-articular, the thoughts are that it's less likely to heal than the inferior fascicle. Any MRI scan report I ever get never mentions the two, but in fact, this paper from, from uh, James Calder's group shows that in 3D volumetric MRI, you can actually identify the separate fascicles in the majority of patients, and they saw two fascicles in 87% of their patients. Calcaneofibular ligament is twice as strong. It runs uh, not from the tip of the fibula as people think, but uh, just anterior to the tip of the fibula. So confident with the ATFL runs backwards and the majority of the ligament is covered by the perineal tendons. This shows roughly the angle it's obtained. So it tends to run posteriorly to, to the calcaneus. So there's some more work from Jordi Vegas group in Barcelona. So they dissected about 30 normal ankles and they, they found the two bands, as I said, the superior and inferior fascicle, but they also find that there's, there's this arcuate li ligament between the uh, inferior fascicle and the CFL. Um, and their theory is that if the lateral fibrocalcaneal ligament complex, which they call this, this bottom part is damaged, then you get classical, uh, lateral link of instability if it's just the superior fascicle they can give you what they call the skull is micro instability so just uh, the ligament doesn't heal properly and you're left with a much weaker inferior ligament fascicle some of the the older textbooks also describe a lateral telocalcaneal ligament um this paper from burke described three different patterns but in fact in over 40 percent of the patients or the cadavers that they dissected out, there was a missing ligament. So there's a little bit of debate about what, whether this is a pathological ligament or not. And I know this is something that Andy's uh, probably going to talk about. Then we go on to the posterior ligament. So the posterior ligament runs more or less uh, transversely from the, uh, the fibula attaching onto this posterior tailor process or onto an ostrigonum. And I, I, I think this is one of the causes of uh, ongoing pain after an ankle fracture because the ligament actually causes an ostrigonum to become unstable or a posterior stator process fracture. Again, some dissections from uh, Barcelona showing that in fact, all there are some uh, connections between all of the ligaments if you look at it from the medial side. And uh, we know that the each of these ligaments has its own uh, purpose, but you can see that in plantar flexion, the ATFL is, is taut and under stress, whereas in dorsiflexion, it's loose and CFL, PTFL are taut. So depending where the foot position is, will make a difference to the ligament that's likely to get damaged. So what about the medial ligaments then? So the uh, deltoid runs from the medial malleolus to the navicular talus calcaneus, but also onto the spring ligament complex. And it's really there to stabilize the medial ankle. It stops translation of the uh, talus medial and posterior lanteli, but also uh, rotationally st stabilize the talus. And the thoughts are that the superior group, so you have superior and 
deep superior grip uh, resist eversion of the hind foot, whereas the deep ligaments are a restraint to external rotation of the talus. And if you look at the anatomy, the generally there's a lot of debate about the individual ligament names, but there's basically a superficial and a deep components. The superficial are from the tibia to the navicular, to the spring ligament, to the calcaneus, and then a posterior superior ligament. And if you see on this uh, image here, the blue ones, the tibial navicular, yellow is tibial spring, tibial calcaneal red, and they're all from the anterior colliculus, whereas the post superior posterior tibial, tibial fibula comes from the posterior colliculus. And then the deep components, the deep posterior and deep anterior, some argue it's all one ligament, but it runs deep, and they're the ones just from the, uh, obviously, the medial malleus onto the talus. And here you can see another anatomical dis dis uh, dissection showing that they actually are all confluent which is with, e with each other, and it, it's maybe a bit artificial to call them individual ligaments. Just to remind you, the spring ligament, which is really the sling for the navicular head, uh, that's where the, the typical spring ligament attaches onto it. So it's got the two main parts, the superior medial calcaneal navicular ligament, which is the main strong point at the front, and then the in inferior ligament. So syndesmosis, the syndesmosis is really uh, allows the different widths of the tail. So as the talus comes up, it becomes wider, and that basically the syndesmosis allows for that uh, anatomy. So you've got the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament. So that comes from Shapkut's tubercle onto the Wagstaff before tubercle. And this ligament is generally, again, multifacetaled. So there are several fascicles perforated by branches of the, uh, the perineal artery. And you can see that the inferior fascicle is nearly always distinct and quite often leads, leads to impingement, which we call Bassett's ligament. It's more anterior and deep. Posteriorly, you've got uh, the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is a very broad, strong structure. It's very, it's unusual that it gets torn. It's more likely that you get an avulsion of the posterior malleolus. Uh, that's actually labeled wrongly. That should be the uh, the uh, inferior tibiofibular, uh, just the tibiofibular ligament, the transverse tibiofibular ligament. Uh, the If you look at the component, there's a deep and superficial component, and the deep component actually works like a labrum at the back to, to stabilize the talus. You can see the interosseous membrane comes down, and in the majority of people, there's a thickening at the bottom called the, in, uh, the, the interosseous ligament rather than membrane, but it's actually absent in some patients. And here we can see from the uh, a side on view looking at the fibula. So you've AITFL here, PITFL, which is superficial and deep, and it's this deep component that actually forms a, almost an artificial labrum. So that's a quick run through of the anatomy, and then we're going to pass on to uh, some more clinical stuff to Francesc. Great, thank you very much. Now we're going to have uh, Frances' video. Um, he was travelling from um, uh, on a plane that was delayed and, and hence very sensibly has put together uh, his talk of the video. He has actually landed and is going to join us for the discussion. So if we can now play um, the video. Hello, I'm uh, Frances Malagolada and I'm going to talk about the uh, arthroscopic lateral ligament repair. Up until now, the brostrum was considered the gold standard for ligament repair, but there are several reasons as to why a brostrum open repair, where both the ATFL and the CFL are being repaired, is not required anymore. Instead, an all-inside arthroscopic ligament repair of the ATFL can be an alternative. And these reasons comprise um, the biomechanical, clinical, and anatomical um, considerations. Biomechanically, there's no difference in anterior displacement and varus tilt with or without repair of the CFL. And this is well supported on the clinical field. There are excellent results published showing anterior translation and tailor tilt being equal to the contralateral side 
uh, 10 years of follow-up. And another long-term study at nine years with equally good results. Finally, an RCT with level one of evidence equally demonstrating no differences in both functional or radiological results. And I also wanted to address the issue of the gold uh, retinaculum reinforcement. Uh, we question, are we really doing a retinaculum repair? And we did this anatomical study that showed some interesting findings. Uh, number one, not all retinaculums have a supralateral limb, and instead of featuring an X-shaped retinaculum, it is more of a Y shape. Number two, even in those with an X shape, as you can see in the middle picture, the supralateral limb is the thinnest one. But not only that, the retinaculum is really a hard, quite a hard structure. It does not have the elasticity to go from its anatomical area to um, all the way up to reach the fibula. So what we think we are repairing with a gold reconstruction is probably soft tissue but not the retinaculum. In addition, it is crossed by the uh, superficial perineal nerve branch which can be at risk of injury and if you add to all the above um, that biomechanically is not a necessary gesture, the final answer is that no gold should be performed. There's also a more uh, logistical reason. Um, in terms of logistics, the usual surgical procedure in chronic ankle instability is um, formed by stage one and ankle arthroscopy. And you do that to look for associated intraarticular pathology that we know it's up to 80% in some cases. So the question is why not doing it all arthroscopically given that we are doing it anyway. And I think that um, or in, in, in the end we were lacking an anatomical explanation as to why the CFL was not needed as part of the repair. Um, we knew it worked, uh, it worked, but why? And we might have found the answer with this article that we published. Um, that's how the ankle looks prior to a ligamentous dissection and you need a trained anatomist with good surgical skills to di dissect adequately and I think we have him in Mickey Dalmau. He noticed that the classic description is of the ATFL being formed um, by two bundles, the superior and the inferior, plus the CFL as a separate structure. However, this is very easy to over dissect and on the left it's, a, it's an example of over dissection but uh, if you are careful, in reality the ligamentous fi fibers look more like that. There is a connection with um, those fibers and this connection is between the inferior ATFL band and the CFL and that's what we called the fibulotalocalcaneal ligament complex. And so when the ATFL is tightened, by means of these connections, the CFL ends up being tightened too. For all these reasons, it, seem, it seems sensible to perform the whole procedure arthroscopically and reduce morbidity caused by open surgery. In, it results in uh, the same functional uh, scores and reduced return to activities with faster um, weight bearing uh, being allowed. And this is a video of the technique as described in an article at JBJS that we published. Uh, we use the typical anterior portals and accessory and also an accessory lateral portal uh, which you can see here um, very close to the uh, tip of the fibula. Um, but that lateral portal is one centimeter proximal and anterior to the tip of the lateral malleolus. And, and here's how it is created with, with the needle and the, um, and the knife. You then um, penetrate the ligament remnant with, an, uh, with uh, um, the needle and a nitinol wire 
that is then grasped through the accessory portal and pulled out of the ankle to introduce the thread to catch the ligament. And now this thread is going in into the ankle through this accessory portal and it's going around the ligament. Once there, we grasp the um, thread again and we, with the intention of, of creating uh, a lasso loop by pu putting one of the ends through the loop and grasping the ligament. like so. Now uh, we're debriding the footprint of the ATFL at the tip of the fibula to create a rough area for good, um, good healing with a shaver. And then we create a bone tunnel at the same footprint for the anchor to be inserted and we're using um, knotless anchors. Once the tunnel is created, then the thread is charged into the anchor and tension to bring that ligament all the way up to its footprint and the anchor is then introduced while uh, keeping the ankle in dorsiflexion and eversion. The stitches are then sectioned and, and, and cut, um, the thread is cut and then this is the final result. The regime consists of a boot for uh, four weeks where the patient can start full weight bearing straight away. Physiotherapy can start for range of motion at two weeks, uh, trying to avoid full plantar flexion uh, and only going up to neutral uh, to avoid stretching the ligament. Uh, they can start on the treadmill at about um, six to eight weeks and return to sports uh, in the majority is at around 12 weeks. And that's all. Thank you very much. And she just has to yeah. um, clear That was a superb video. Um, thank you, um, Francesca. That was uh, a, an amazing rendition. We're now going to move on to um, the session on the, the next bit, which is on, on basically the open, the counter to the arthroscopic. So, um, We've all seen patients that come back uh, after uh, some have had ankle ligament repairs. Some people have uh, not really got any findings that, that are clear of an ankle um, AGFL instability. And this is a misnomer of subtalar instability. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's quite uh, vague in terms of what actually subtalar instability is. Um, and it's actually very difficult if not impossible to distinguish between ankle and subtalar instability clinically the patients just say that the ankle just doesn't feel right even if they've had an atfl repair um, they can walk and jog they can run in a straight line they just can't cut thrust twist turn um, as they would like to do and sometimes there's a there's a sign which i've called the contralateral sleep sign which is if they sleep on the opposite side to the side affected when their leg is plantar flexed and an equinus then the tissue gets caught in the subfibular space and they wake up with pain um, and they just want to click it back um, and um, and that's often the presentation that, that the patients have now we said before about the ligaments we've had a beautiful rendition of those ligaments um, and the problem is is that the anatomical models are based on people who are sadly well dead um, and they probably had ankle sprains and so it's almost impossible to know when you're looking at a sample whether or not this patient had 
ligamentous injuries in the past um, at some stage in there, however many years they were alive. Um, and that's the confounding factor. Now, the other issue is that the subtalar joint is obviously a very complicated joint. This is from a, a beautiful paper by Fernandez uh, in uh, Nature Scientific Reports, uh, this diagram. And you can see that um, the subtalar joint, which, which obviously has the three facets of the subtalar joint, the spring ligament that we've spoken about, and the ligaments on either side, um, create, confer the stability to the subtalar joint. And the calcaneofibular ligament is very important stabilizer of the subtalar joint as is the deltoid and, and um, on the medial side. And I, I think the best way to think about it is a bit like a knee, where you've got your cruciate ligaments and your medial and lateral collateral ligaments, and the deltoid and the CFL are its collateral ligaments. There's undoubtedly capsule between the, sub uh, the, the talus and the calcaneum, but there's not really a ligament. There shouldn't be a ligament. It should normally go, but the CFL goes from the calcaneum to the fibula. Um, and this is the dissection. Uh, and although the capsule is there sitting there between the two, it's not really thickened. The, the end of the day, a, 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 a ligament is a thickening of a capsule. So it just responds to the forces that joints put under it. And the CFL and the ATFL are the response to those forces. If you're getting thickening on a new ligament, like a calcaneo talocalcaneal ligament, then it's most likely because the anatomy of the two above ligaments is abnormal. In other words, there's been a problem okay now also your cfl can pull off and with gravity can move forwards um, onto the talus and we'll talk about that now in this position where you've got the cfl and the atfl this joint is so stable it's un it cannot be moved around at all i mean there's no way of ever seeing into that joint um when you however cut the atfl and the cfl suddenly the ankle joint will almost sublux outwards and you can see into the subtalar joint. So those joints are hugely responsible for the stability of both the ankle and the subtalar joint. And when you look at the subtalar joint, I'm just going to mute the video and play it again. When you look at the subtalar joint, when you see that, that's very clear instability. Okay, that's both ankle and subtalar instability so that is tilting and that the tilt sign is what you're looking for but often when you do this before you do a test you don't see that and you see this instead so you're moving the same motion but there is no motion at the tibio tailor joint okay so the atfl is intact but the cfl is not intact OK, so when, when you look at this um, uh, anatomically, what you're seeing is the calcaneal tuberosity moving around 45, 50 degrees in terms of its range. And that is very different than ankle. So you can see here the subtalar joint is mo moving. The ankle is not moving, but the calcaneal tuberosity is moving about 50 degrees. And that is subtalar instability, which is indistinguishable from ankle instability. And if you put the patient onto their put the patient onto their side, what you'll see if you internally rotate is the talus appears to drift forward. It's not clearly drifting forward. What it's doing is rotating internally, and that is the role of the CFL to check that motion. And that instability is is subtail instability, indistinguishable from ATFL. Now the point, as Francesca had said. Um, that when you're seeing this and this opening here, um, it's very difficult to distinguish between the two, but the, the clinical results of ATFL alone are pretty good. So why is that? Well, I suppose the reason is that um, these ligaments all work together. Now, when the CFL pulls off, it, can some, it often comes off with the ATFL and moves just a few millimeters forward and sticks to the front of the fibula. So still attached to the fibula, but a few millimeters forward and therefore a little lax. And that's what we call mild ligamentous laxity. But sometimes it pulls off completely. It's still attached to the ATFL and then it sticks onto the side of the talus. And that is often then known as the talocalcaneal ligament, but it's no longer attached to the fibula. Uh, and these are variants that, that um, 
don't necessarily get picked up in the nuances in these anatomical. So when we see this happening, if you like, what's really happened is that the in, in this case, the CFL had detached onto the talus and they didn't have instability of the ATFL. So when you look at the clinical results, although they're very good with just an ATFL without the CFL, most of the papers still have a proportion of patients that don't do well. In Mafuli's paper, which is about 38 patients, they showed a 16% failure rate. And six of the patients did not feel safe with their ankle because they called it new episodes of ankle instability. So these are the patients and all the series, in fact, that were listed before, all of them have failures. And I think those failures are often sometimes predictable when you actually intricately look at the scans. There's also another point, which is that a ligament attaches proximally and distally. And the assumption is that the injury is always the proximal attachment, which is not always the case. Sometimes you can have a distal detachment. Here's an example. This is an example here where you can see this is into the ankle joint. There's the fibula and there's the perineal tendons, which are retracted out of the way. And underneath them, there's the CFL completely lax in all positions because it's attached to the fibula, but not attached distally. It's pulled off, evulsed and only attached onto the soft tissues in the perineal sheath. And it's detached. And you can see now both ankle and the ATFL is obviously being divided. But that is very, very difficult to treat arthroscopically. So this is the reason why in certain cases where you think there's a distal detachment, you have to do an open repair. And there's a further variant. My video sounds. This is an example where the perineal, where the CFL has actually dislocated and come out superficial to the perineal tendons. Okay, so it's actually sitting superficial to the perineal tendons and that will never repair itself. Um, I think the best analogy would be to a stenner lesion in the thumb. Okay, when we looked back, even though the report had reported it as, as just a normal, there was no CFL injury reported on the original MRI scan. When we went back and look at this one, we could see that the CFL was sitting Pro, uh, uh, superficial to the perineal tendons. It had come out and flipped underneath. Uh, and that's like a steno lesion that will never heal. And that patient obviously required open surgery. So now when I go in there, I do an open repair pretty much universally. And if I think that the ATFL and CFL, so the first video of the opening happens, then I will do a uh, uh, repair, a normal brostrum of the ATFL. I will put an anchor into the base of the CFL literally and you pull back the perineals you put a suture tech 1.6 dx suture anchor into the uh calcaneum just below the cfl at, uh, the attachment you then bring it superficial the fibers the, the the stitch superficial to the cfl so it's deep to the perineals but superficial to the P cfl and you put it out you then put an internal brace as standard but you put the small anchor into the distal attachment to the talus and then you bring both the FiberTech suture tape, not suture, suture, but suture tape, so the tape proximally, and you also bring the proximal limb of the internal brace, and both limbs then get attached into the um, 4.75 uh, anchor, swivel lock anchor into the fibula. So that looks effectively like this. So the FiberTech deep suture tape is sitting up here, superficial to the CFL, so outside of the joint, but deep to the perineals and the internal brace is standard. Um, and um, whilst I'm doing that, we also always look at the um, perineal tendons as a routine now in part of our... You can see that the perineal tendons on the you get frayed when you have an injury. And you have to, and that's why you get tendinopathy, why you get tear, because they come around from the technology. Apologies for the technology. Um, so, in summary, it's really important to remember that ligaments can detach proximally and distally. And it's really important for you to work out which ones, because 
Um, if you just attach the proximal end, assuming that it's always a proximal detachment, you will miss cases where there's a distal attachment as well. Um, the CFL, I think, is a really important ligament. I'm passionate about it, and I think it often sticks onto the talus, creating an uncertainty of, of anatomy, as we've discussed. And personally, I think an anatomic repair is essential. Although um, most of the series of leaving the CFL alone are very positive, there are always failures. And I would say in our 104, I think, is the last lot that we looked at, which we haven't yet published, we're going to. Um, we only had four failures, and that's because the patients already had arthritic changes due to chronic ankle and subtail instability. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, we'll discuss this more in the discussions. And I'm now going to pass you on to my esteemed colleague, Nick Harris, who's going to tell us about uh, the AITFL. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, can you hear me, Andy? Yes, we can hear you. Um, just need to put your slides on. Okay, I've got my... If you can take control now, that's great. Yep, have you got... We can hear you, off you go. Okay, well, listen, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to talk about uh, the syndesmosis and in particular uh, anatomic reconstruction of the anterior inferior tib fib ligament uh, in elite athletes using the internal brace uh, suture tape. So syndesmotic injuries have uh, been known for a long time, first described in 1907 by Quenu. Uh, the incidence is very variable in the literature, but I think they probably occur more frequently than we think. And I think with MRI scans, we're diagnosing more and more. Um, the diagnosis, classification and management of syndesmotic injuries remains controversial. Uh, Surgery is indicated for displaced or unstable syndesmotic injuries. Uh, so what are your treatment options? We've got uh, syndesmotic screws, suture button, you know, tight rope, zip tight, direct repair, uh, and the internal brace. So here we've got some screws. And here we've got some, uh, some broken screws. There is no consensus on the position, the size, the number of screws or the number of cortices needed to stabilize the syndesmosis. And about 90% of surgeons routinely remove the screws. So what about suture buttons? Here's a good example of two suture buttons, tight ropes. Uh, and this is one of the problems we see with, uh, with tight ropes if they're left in situ. And uh, so tight ropes, I think, are great. And, and I use lots of tight ropes. However, like everything, there, there's a difference. We've got complication rates of up to 44%. And these include things like wound breakdown, prominent knots, syn syndesmotic widening, synostosis, osteomyelitis, aseptic osteolysis, unexplained pain, and restricted dorsiflexion. Um, we've recently had two professional footballers treated elsewhere, both of whom have had stress fractures in the fibula um, where the tightrope's been. So I actually routinely take out tightropes now, about 12 months having put them in. So this was an interesting paper I read a few years ago by Regauer about using the internal brace to, to reconstruct the syndesmosis. And particularly, he described it for both the anterior and the posterior syndesmosis. But, uh, I tend to use it for the anterior syndesmosis. I, I, I was particularly interested in this because it, it struck me that it, the internal brace might provide additional rotational stability and it's an anatomic reconstruction. So because of the obliquity, I think when you deflect, just a little bit of widening, sort of almost physiological widening of the syndesmosis, which I believe sort of allows a bit more dorsiflexion. Um, So, so what is the internal brace? I'm not going to spend too long about this because uh, we all kind of know what the internal brace is. It consists of fibre tape, two bicomposite swivel locks. We know that the fibre tape has been uh, very safe over the years. Uh, we know the, the, the swivel locks are bicomposite screws. 
Uh, and we know at two years, they're pretty safe. So let's get on to what we did. So, so we looked at 20 consecutive professional or elite sportsmen with unstable syndesmotic injuries. Uh, and they were offered a reconstruction of the anterior inferior tib fib ligament with the internal brace, provided the posterior syndesmosis was intact. We classified the syndesmotic injuries using the West Point classification. So I'm sure you all know this, the West Point classification. Uh, grade three is unstable and with more than two millimeters of widening. A uh, grade two B is disruption of the anterior syndesmosis with an injury to the interosseous ligament, but with a positive squeeze test, and they were regarded as unstable. And a grade two A is complete disruption of the anterior syndesmosis, an injury to the interosseous ligament, but with a negative squeeze test, and these were regarded as stable. So here's an MRI scan. And uh, or a couple of MRI scans, as you can see here, this is a rupture of the anterior, complete rupture of the anterior syndesmosis. There's fluid tracking all the way around here, and there's a partial injury to the posterior syndesmosis, and similarly on this side as well. So, uh, patients had a face to face follow up at two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks, and two patients had face to face follow ups at six months. All patients had a remote follow-up consultation, the mean of 27 months. Now, we did this during COVID, which is why we had a remote consultations uh, at, at two years. Patients had AOFF ankle scores. We measured their knee to wall distance and in particular their time to return to play. And, and these are the two things that, uh, that, that were issues for me to some extent with the tightrope. Uh, we found some patients did have restricted dorsiflexion, no matter how carefully you tension the tightrope. Uh, and for some patients, the, the syndesmosis remained irritable, which kind of delayed their return to play, which is one of the reasons I explored the anterior or using the internal brace. So this is a, uh, a play, he's given me permission to show this, one of the Leeds rhinos from just a few weeks ago. He's playing St. Helens here. He gets tackled by three guys and suffers uh, external rotation injury to his right ankle, you can see there. This is his MRI, so he's got a loads of blood and completely ruptured the anterior syndesmosis. There's an impression of a bit of widening at the front. Now, I wonder whether we should have a, a West Point um, 2C that sort of isn't a complete disruption of the syndesmosis, or isn't a complete displacement of the syndesmosis, but there's a little bit of widening at the front. Certainly to me, there seems like there's some widening there. Uh, it comes through the back. There's a partial injury to the back, but this is, there's still some of the posterior syndesmosis intact there. So these were the weight bearing x-rays and you can see here on the right side there's a bit of widening this measured seven millimeters compared to four on the other side and this was an intraoperative picture you can see this is the syndesmosis now what i'll do is i'll show you a, an intraoperative external rotation stress test uh, hopefully this is going to come up so as you externally rotate you can see the syndesmosis opening and I think uh, one of the reasons sometimes these injuries are, are missed or underdiagnosed is that we do the MRI scan in a, in a standard plantigrade position. And I think if when you suspect an external a, a syndesmotic type injury, if you did the MRI scan in slight external rotation, I think you probably find more of these would be classified as grade three rather than grade two. So we elected to reconstruct this with an anterior or an internal brace anteriorly. You can see you've got one screw there, one screw there. It's very anatomic. And then My video doesn't seem to be playing there. Let me just go back on. Go back one back onto there nope well that's an external rotation stress test and uh, you have to take it from me it doesn't open at all and then in this particular case there was sufficient uh, anterior syndesmotic or the anterior inferior tib fib ligament to reconstruct over the top there it, it came together very nicely but often it's shredded and you can't do that Okay. And I've got another example here. This you can see it very wide there. And 
and then with the internal brace, it closes up. It's a very powerful reconstruction. And this is a rugby league player who got a, a pretty low distal fibula fracture. And having fixed the fra fracture, when I did an external rotation stress test, uh, the anterior syndrome syndesmosis open so I put two uh, internal braces across the front and again very stable. A couple of our players also suffered an injury to the anterior talofibular ligament um, and, and I'm always confused as to how you suffer an injury to your syndesmosis uh, and then also suffer an injury to your anterior talofibular ligament. They're different mechanisms, one's an inversion type injury and the other's an external rotation type injury. So, if I show you this video of a Hull FC player, that he gets he gets tackled here. I think he's played Featherstone Rovers, and he lands with an inverted right foot, and he pops his ATFL there. Then they land on him. He plants his foot. suffers an external rotation type injury. So again, he's got a complete disruption of the anterior syndesmosis and a complete disruption of his ATFL. So this is his intraoperative image here. So this is the reconstruction of the anterior syndesmosis with an internal brace and we've hitched up the capsule on the ATFL um, with a couple of suture anchors there. So of the 20 patients, one of them we lost to follow up, he returned to Australia, which left 19 patients. There were nine Super League Rugby League players, six pro footballers, three rugby union players, and one high alpine elite climber. Um, so nine patients had a West Point grade three and 10 patients had a West Point grade two B. There was all the associated pathology. So 12 patients had isolated unstable syndesmotic injuries, but we had three fibular fractures two medial malleolus fractures, two posterior malleolus fractures, and two associated ATFL ruptures. One player developed a delayed union of his medial malleolus, and he took the longest to return to play, 28 weeks. He's been back playing, whole KR. He, did, he lost a little bit of range of dorsiflexion. His knee to wall was 11 centimetres versus 13. And this is this player. He's got a high fibular fracture, medial malleolus. Um, he had an internal brace across the front, plate screws. So in our series, all patients returned to their pre-injury level of sports. The mean return to play for isolated injuries was 62 days. The mean return to play if you had an associated injury was 104 days. The AOFS score returned to 100 in all patients. We kind of know the AOF is not that discriminative in elite athletes. It's got a low ceiling, but nevertheless, there were 100. The knee to wall distance was similar to the other side in 18 patients. And I said earlier, one patient lacked two centimetres of dorsiflexion compared to the other side. And this is better than we found uh, our tight ropes. We had no complications related to the internal brace. And we have no, no radiological complications today. I've not taken any of the internal braces out. Now, it might just be time. So return to full training has previously been reported to between nine to 10 weeks following tightrope repair of isolated syndesmotic injuries in elite football and rugby players. The Who looked at 110 professional footballers with isolated unstable syndesmotic injuries treated surgically. On-field rehab started at 37 days, team training 72 days, first match 103 days. In our series, the mean return to play for isolated injuries was 60 two days, and if you've got an associated injury, 104 days. Return to play was defined as a return to full training and available for selection. So, um, you know, return to play can mean different things to different people. So, so anecdotally, and I still use a lot of tight ropes, anecdotally, we found players treated with an internal brace did better than those treated with a tight rope when comparing similar injuries. Patients treated with the internal brace when indicated in our hands had less pain, less restriction in door deflection, and a quicker return to play and fewer complications when compared to a tightrope. Do 
does in, uh, why is that? Does the internal bra brace provide better rotational stability than the tightrope? I think it probably does. I also think that because it's an anatomical reconstruction, it allows when you dorsiflex a little bit of widening, almost physiological widening of the syndesmosis. And I think those two factors, in my mind, are why we get slightly better results. They're only slightly better, but nevertheless, if you're a professional athlete, if you get back playing a week or two sooner, then that's better. Clearly, more research is needed, but at, at present, our preference is to use the interface in unstable syndesmotic injuries in elite athletes where the posterior syndesmosis is still intact. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nick, for an amazing, amazing presentation. Um, that paper has been published and, and is highly cited, I believe. Um, if every, all the speakers would like to come back on, Francesca is stuck at an airport. And so um, if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers, please don't hesitate um, to put them on the chat now and um, uh, we'll, we'll go through them. There's a question actually from uh, Andre Lemos, which said, uh, you only did the internal brace and no tightrope. Uh, sometimes do you think you need both, Nick? Um, it's a good question, and, and I have a where where I'm worried about the posterior syndesmosis. I've just resorted to using a couple of tight ropes, which has been my established traditional management for these. Um, so I've really restricted the internal brace just when it's an isolated anterior syndesmosis, and. Um, so, yeah, I think if you use the tightrope as well, you'd probably get more stability, but you've also got the risks with the tightrope. One of the problems we're having with the tightrope is it does cause osteolysis. I think because it's non-anatomic, I think it does restrict ankle dorsiflexion. I've had uh, a number of rugby league players who I've operated on two or three years down the line, having been treated with a tightrope. I've removed the tightrope and they've had a surprising increase in ankle dorsiflexion two or three centimeters in their, in their knee to wall. So the tightrope, even though there's lots of osteolysis around it, must in some way be restricting ankle dorsiflexion. So I still use a tightrope and I think it's a good device, um, but like all devices, it's got its downside. So I probably wouldn't use both together. Great, okay. So um, John, you talked about um, uh, the the ligaments the, the medial side seems very complex do you think we could ever anatomically repair the medial ligaments well i guess it's like we we said for ligaments are uh like thickening of the capsule and if you get them back in the right place they'll heal so you know the only time you really need to 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 repair ligaments is if they are in the wrong place or if they are healed too long and they're too you know unstable so i think if you're doing something with the medial side as long as you get the the torn ligaments touching back together and hold them there securely they sh they should heal so did that answer your question <laughs> this, this oh, is I a question hear. can you hear me now this is a question to to everyone really which is the We've talked about fractures, Nick, in association with syndesmotic injuries or ligament injuries. And I love the video where you could see the double mechanism. We often see patients where they've got things that don't can't be explained logically, but they always have multiple things. But um, the, the tail OCD is the one that gets me that, that's sort of you've not mentioned about that. What about management of tail OCDs in the presence of syndesmosis or, or ligaments? That's to both of you. Uh, do you want me to go, Andy? Yeah, go, go first, Nick, and then... then yeah, yeah, I, well, I, well I, I'd scope, scope them and uh, deal with them at, at the same time. And in fact, you know, scoping them is, a, is, is just a, an added layer of uh, being able to assess the syndesmosis at, this, at the same time. So, so I, I would deal with it at the same time. Um, you the, ju the you great thing about... What, what do you do for them? Um, well, it, it really kind of depends on the size of the lesion you know if it's a partial thickness unstable fragment i usually remove it if it's a big osteochondral fragment i fix it back um so uh, but you know of course i try and deal with it at the same time um but uh, in my practice i pro probably don't do as many arthroscopies as, as you do because w when i fix the anterior syndesmosis I, I don't need to do an arthroscopy pre-operatively because i can actually do that external rotation stress test and actually visualize 
the syndesmosis opening. So I'll only do a I'll only do an arthroscopy if the MRI scan preoperatively suggests there may be evidence of an osteochondral injury at the same time. So, um... John, what about yourself? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I really like your your talk about the internal brace, Nick. I think I, I've only done a couple, but it, it does make sense if the posterior is intact. But I'll I'll always do a scope regardless. So. Uh, I think even if I was doing well, I, even if I'm doing a, a internal brace, I would still do a scope just because I quite like scoping. But if there's no CD, I'll deal with it same same way that you would. Um, just an, another thought, which is which is we're talking about these ligament repairs, but we're not talking about the timing of the ligament repairs. Um, if you do your ACL and you're in the slopes in in Oh, in Switzerland, you'd have your ACL repaired on the same day. Is there a role for ligamentous repair in the ankle acutely? Uh, John, you go first with this one. I think I think for like ATFL tear, no, because if you're mobilised, like how often do you see somebody who's a professional athlete with ankle instability? It's it's pretty uncommon because they rehab them properly. They you know mobilise them a little bit. Syndesmosis is, is very different, but I, I would say no. I think it's it's pretty rare that I would do anything uh, acutely to just a lateral ligament injury. Um, Nick, any thoughts on doing an acute repair? Yeah, absolutely. So syndesmosis, yep, yeah, always do that as an acute repair. You know, if I think it's unstable, um, I suppose I disagree with John a little bit there. I do quite a lot of uh, acute ATFL and CFL repairs. Um, for a number of reasons. I think that uh, if I see a patient who's got a grade three ATFL and CFL and I examine them and they've got a massive anterior draw and sulcus sign, uh, the idea that that ligament is just going to jump back on the fibula or the talus and heal itself uh, without immobilizing them in a plaster or a boot for six weeks, I think you, I, I, just, I just don't get it. And I, I've, I've certainly managed lots of pro footballers um, and I've examined them at 12 weeks, I managed them conservatively and they're unstable. Now, these guys can play with unstable ankles. They're amazing athletes uh, and they often use their secondary restraints. But what happens is towards the end of the game is their perineals fatigue and things. They've got a greater chance, I think, of going over on the ankle. So, so pro footballers and pro rugby league players are amazing athletes and they can have really unstable ankles and they can still continue to play. That doesn't mean uh, uh, we should be managing them all conservatively, in my opinion. The second reason is that... Uh, the more I do acutely, the more I want to do acutely. Um, you mentioned in your talk, Andy, about uh, they don't always come off from the fibula. You're absolutely right. I would say in about 50% of cases, they come off from the talus. And if you operate acutely, you can actually see where it comes off and you just stitch it back in with a couple of anchors. Uh, it's a very low, it's an operation with low morbidity. I'm getting great results and uh, more and more footballers and rugby players are coming to have that surgery. So for me, I I'm doing more and more acute repairs. I'm getting better and better results. And um, so, so... Yeah, that's, that's my opinion. Sorry. Well, I, I, I think I agree with you because, you know, when you see an athlete and they want they want immediate results, they don't want to wait six weeks to know whether or not rehab is going to work for them. And I think that's a really difficult position to be in. I guess the problem is, is that there's no real strong supporting evidence. We probably need some more papers out there to sort of people are probably scared of operating acutely. So we probably need some 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 published literature on the acute repair of lateral ligament injuries i'm pretty sure i've done acute ones and they do amazingly and you can see exactly the an the anatomy but you've got to get to them quickly if you try and if you wait two or three weeks then it's all sort of like trying to um nail a custard to a wall yeah absolutely uh, and in and you find the defects then full of scar tissue and uh, and it you know, it's, of course you know we get good results doing delayed rostrums don't we um, but I'm getting better results doing acute ones, which is why it's something I'm doing more and more. Um, and um, Francesca's replied it because he's he's stuck in, in, in an airport, so and he can't join us. But um, uh, uh, he's he's kind of in agreement. He said it's not something that he does, and I think most of us feel slightly aggrieved at not doing it acutely. For the for I think probably because we'd like to, but but scared not to do it but um that I, I i do think this is a call for publications on on the acute repair the acute athletes because um i think just like uh uh um the knee that th th there's definitely a role for it um we have one final question from the audience um uh and and that is um 
just very quickly, Nick, we've only got one minute. The 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 A the, the syndesmosis where the patient comes back and there's only subtle findings. Do you scope them to work out if you're going to proceed, or do you? What's your thoughts on 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 making a decision making in the non obvious syndesmotic injury? So that's to both of you. Yeah, sure. I I, I do scope them, but um, I don't use scope or rely on scoping patients uh, as uh, so much. And the and the reason for that is that once you've got a patient anaesthetized and you put a scope in the ankle. There's quite a lot of pressure then to go ahead and do an operation. So I've kind of usually made my decision before they've gone into the operating room as to whether I think they've got an unstable syndesmosis or not. Um, and usually there might be their MRI findings. Uh, when you examine them clinically, they may have features that suggest they've got an unstable syndesmosis. Um, so so I, I do scope them uh, and it's part of um, a, 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 it's certainly a thing that I use to help me make that decision, but it's not something I use in isolation. And usually by the time I got in the, in the operating room, I've already made my decision as to whether I think it's unstable or not. And, uh, you know, if you've got a patient six or 12 weeks down the line who's ruptured their anterior syndesmosis um, and they're still grumbling. And that's one of the problems we have with managing these conservatively is that um, you find that it's a very common rugby league injury, which is why we do a lot in Yorkshire. Um, you manage these conservatively and they do really well for six weeks and they can jog in a straight line, they can get up to 70-80% of their maximum effort, but as soon as they start exploding off the ankle and externally rotate, it tends to break down, It becomes uh, the ankle becomes an uh, uh, angry, they lose dorsiflexion, so um, clinically Brilliant. they always kind of present. Yep. Brilliant, it looks like we've run out of time because we're just at the last minute, so I'll pass um, back over to uh, Celine. Thank you for having us, Celine, and... Um, uh, you look like you're in your car, so so um, I hope you're keeping up with the coffee. Yeah, I am. Thank you very much, you guys, for an awesome uh, session.